Okay, hello everyone. I'm James Shaheen, Tricycle's editor and publisher. Thank you for joining us this evening with Donald Lopez on the eve of baseball's opening day. We'll be discussing Don's latest book, Luda Takes the Mound, Enlightenment in Nine Innings. As many of you know, Donald S. Lopez Jr. is professor of Buddhist and Tibetan studies in the Department of Asian Languages at the University of Michigan. He's the author of many books, actually more than I can count, on Buddhism and has been instrumental in shaping the field of Buddhist studies. His latest book is a bit of a departure from his scholarly work and mixes baseball and humor with fundamental teachings on Buddhism. Don will start with a reading and I'll follow with a few questions. Please feel free to ask your own questions in the Zoom Q&A panel accessible through the button below the video screen and we'll get to as many of you as we can in our time together. So thank you, Don, for being with us today, and I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, James. Uh, as we talked about this event months ago, uh, the idea was for you and I to be sitting on a stage together in New York. Uh, we were going to have this event uh, after the All-Star break, uh, deep into the season, uh, on a night when the Yankees were out of town. <laughs> and I think if someone had told us that uh, I would be in Ann Arbor, You'd be in New York, we'd be speaking by something called Zoom, and the season would not have started yet. I think we would have thought that the world had turned upside down, and of course it has. So uh, thank you for everybody for showing up in this particular venue. Uh, I'm gonna begin by reading uh, the prologue uh, of the, uh, the Baseball Sutra. Uh, so let me begin. Thus did I hear. At one time, the Buddha was residing in a pure land called Yankee Stadium in the city of New York, in the land of America and the Western continent. As he stood near the center of the green mandala, a great rumbling was heard. Beneath his flat feet, each marked with the image of a ball, a great mountain rose from the earth, a full 14 finger breadths in height. Around that mountain, a smaller mandala in the shape of a diamond magically appeared with the border of sand from the river Ganges and a cushion of the finest Banara silk at three corners. Atop the great mountain, there was a slab of alabaster, pure white in color, two cubits long and eight finger breadths wide. Here, the Buddha stood. The mountain was surrounded by a great assembly of immortals, gods, and demigods of the past and present, each gathered at the position in the ten directions of the pure land. At the first square in the east, the Gehrig, Moose, Pepitone, Mattingly, and Martinez. At the second square in the north stood Richardson, Randolph, Soriano, and Cano. At the third square in the west stood McDougal, Boyer, Nettles, and Brocious. At the place between the second square and the third square stood Rizzuto, Kubek, and Jeter. At the place called the Household in the south crouched Vera, Howard, Munson, and Posada, each adorned with the tools of ignorance, each flashing signs. In the place called the Right in the Northeast stood Ruth, Maris, Jackson, Tweet Lou, O'Neill, Godzilla, and Judge. In the place called the center in the north stood DiMaggio, Mantle, Mercer, and Bernie. In the place called the left in the northwest stood White, Winsfield, and Gardner. Standing at the foot of the mountain surrounding the Buddha stood Ford, Reynolds, Gomez, Carey, Stottlemyre, Gator, Catfish, Key, Pettit, Cone, Boomer, El Duque, Moose, Sabathia, and Mo. To the Buddha's left side in a narrow cave dug out of the earth sat Stengel, Hauk, Showalter, and Tori. At that time, without speaking, the Buddha performed a mudra that unites the opposites. He did not need a glove. All Buddhas have webbed fingers. His right hand made a gesture of the circle change. The index finger of his left hand pointed down, calling for a fastball. Then two fingers pointing down for a curveball. Then three fingers pointing down for a slider. And then he emitted a ray of light from between his eyebrows that illuminated all ten directions from the three divisions of the east, central, and west of the national and American from the highest heavens of the major leagues to the deepest levels of low A. All the gods of the pure land and the lay people in the stands were perplexed by this sight. The Bodhisattva called the baby, said to the Bodhisattva called the iron horse. I've long dwelled in this pure land, yet never have I seen the Buddha perform such a miracle. I ask you to explain it to me, you who followed me in the line and who brought me home so many times. The horse of iron replied, it was long ago in another pure land called the old Yankee Stadium, where it was only 295 down the right field line. 
you were there that day, but you, you, you did not remember, but between innings, you'd eaten many hot dogs. On that day, the Buddha also emitted a ray of light from between his eyebrows, illuminating all the leagues in the 10 directions. Then he preached what is called the Baseball Sutra. I believe he will now preach the Baseball Sutra again. Then the Bodhisattva called Seven, stood up, put on his batting helmet, and addressed the Buddha. Lord, in the past, we set forth the Baseball Sutra. The gods of this pure land named Yankee Stadium lived their whole lives in this abode unless they were banished to Kansas City. At that time, as the Buddha of our pure land, you taught this precious sutra only to us. Having meditated on your teaching in the clubhouse, during batting practice, in the on-deck circle, during rainouts, and in the dugout, we, your devoted disciples, went from victory to victory, defeating our enemies in four, five, six, or seven games. Today, because of free agency, our enemies become our friends, our friends become our enemies. Thus, I beseech you to teach the baseball sutra to all the gods of all the pure lands. So the Buddha smiled upon the commerce comment, comment saying, well done, well done, child of this slugging percentage, where of the triple crown, you speak the truth. In the world of baseball on this day, among the gods, there is no friend or enemy. It's only the multitudes who abide in the bleachers who bear enmity throughout their lifetimes. Therefore, I shall teach the baseball sutra to all the gods. The laymen and laywomen seated on the, border, seated on the borders of the mandala began to boo, each in their own language, silent only when the baby stood to speak. Adjusting his jockstrap, he addressed the Buddha, Lord, I do not understand. Your pure land is full, its field filled with Yankees, its seats filled with fans. Our abbots sit in the dugout. The only space is the dugout of our enemies who abide there only for three days or four days or one day to make up a rain out. Yet the gods of the other pure lands are many. There's no space to put the gods of the Eastern Division of the American League, much less the gods of all the divisions of all the leagues. The Buddha replied, did you come for the Dharma or did you come for the dugout? Bambino, you should know that the powers of the Buddha are inconceivable, able to fill the visitor's dugout with all the gods of the other pure lands without changing the size of the gods, without changing the size of the dugout. The Buddha again emitted rays of light from the space between his eyes, the color of a blue pinstripe. Yet as if by a miracle, as those rays approached the other pure lands, they turned into the color of that pure land, blue for the pure land of the Dodgers, Red for the pure land of the Cardinals, green for the pure land of the A's, orange for the pure land of the Mets. As they reached those pure lands, the rays of light were transformed into all manners of gifts for the gods. Gloves, bats, cleats, batting helmets, batting gloves, elbow protectors, catcher's masks, car dealerships, deodorant commercials, and post-game radio shows. Delighted, the gods of the other pure lands boarded their team planes and flew to the city of New York, landing there in the time it takes for a man to bend his arm, after an hour spent in traffic, they arrived at the Pure Land called Yankee Stadium. So that's the prologue. Uh, Tricycle re uh, ran the, uh, the impermanence chapter in the most recent issue. Uh, and so I thought I would now move forward to the chapter after impermanence with the chapter on emptiness. Uh, this is the most uh, philosophically uh, difficult uh, chapter uh, in the sutra, I would say, uh, the chapter on no self but because this is a tricycle audience that is very uh, buddhologically sophisticated, I thought I would choose this one. So, then, by the power of the Buddha, an old man rose from the upper deck along the third base line. He wore a Yankee's cap and a pinstripe jer jer jersey with the number four. Removing his cap, he addressed the Buddha. Oh, one who's gone to happiness, I've been a Yankee's fan my whole life. From the time I watched the 27 Yankees as a seven-year-old boy in the old Yankee Stadium, to the Yankees of today. Over the course of my life, the Yankees have been good and bad. They've won and lost. Thousands of players have worn the pinstripes, some remembered, most forgotten. Now I'm 100 years old. When I watch a game from the stands or on television or listen to the radio, I sometimes ask myself, what are the Yankees? Where are the Yankees? These seem odd questions, easy to answer, and yet I'm plagued with doubt. I asked the enlightened one, enlightened one to enlighten me. The Buddha replied, you ask a wise question, O season ticket holder. I will answer your question with a question of my own. Imagine the Yankees roster on opening day, made up of eight position players, a backup catcher, a fourth outfielder, two utility infielders, a DH, five starters, five long relievers, a seventh inning guy, an eighth inning guy, and a closer. Imagine that because of pulled hamstrings, pulled groins, 
full lats, oblique strains, torn anterior cruciate ligaments, concussions from running into walls, hip pointers, hit batsmen, torn ulnar collateral ligaments, bone spurs, sore shoulders, bad knees, numb fingers, hangnails, slumps, errors, losing streaks, drug suspensions, high ERA and low OBP. Every member of the 26-man opening day roster is replaced on the injured list, is placed on the injured list, sent down, traded, designated for assignment, or given his release at some point during the season. Imagine that on August 31, the day before the roster expands, not a single player from opening day remains. My question to you, old man, is, is this team on August 31 the Yankees? I answer your question by repeating your question back to you. Where are the Yankees? The old man said, Lord, those Yankees are not the Yankees. They may wear the pinstripes, but they are not my team. I look for the Yankees among the players on the roster, but I cannot find them. The Buddha declared, well said, you, you have many seventh inning stretches. Let me now ask more questions and answer them myself. Is Yankee Stadium the Yankees? No, for Yankee Stadium was demolished and a new structure built on a new site. Is the franchise the Yankees? No, the franchise is something concocted by lawyers and bankers to be bought and sold by those who may not have a single bath, have had a single at bath. Is the logo the Yankees? No, because around the world, people wear the cap with the interlocking N and Y who do not know any of the retired numbers. Is it the memories of the fans? No, because the fans grow old and die and their memories die with them. And so I declare, nowhere are the Yankees to be found. The Yankees do not exist. The Yankees are empty. The Yankees are not the Yankees. Therefore, they are the Yankees. The world honored one continued. You see that the householder wears the tools of ignorance, but all sentient beings, players and fans, wear the tools of ignorance. I made this game called baseball to teach fans, players, umpires, agents, scouts, front office people, owners, league executives, vendors, ushers, groundskeepers, writers and broadcasters, that there is no team, there is no baseball. Baseball is emptiness, emptiness is baseball, baseball is not other than emptiness, emptiness is not other than baseball. And why? The caster of the ball seeks the emptiness of the domain of the strike. Whether inside or outside, high or low, above the knees, below the letters, on the black, catching the corner, the emptiness never tainted by wood except for a caught foul tip. The fielder of the baseball seeks the empty space of his brother's glove, whether it be the guardian of the first square, the second square, the third square, or the guardian of the household without short hops or air mail. The striker of the baseball seeks the empty space of the hole, the gap, down the line, the intermediate space between short and deep, the emptiness in the green grass at the foot of the mountain, to the left if the hurler falls off the mountain to the right, to the right if the hurler falls off the mountain to his left, and, and best of all, the emptiness when the ball has gone, gone, gone beyond, gone completely beyond the wall. In emptiness, there are no Yankees. Hearing these words, some players from other teams vomited blood, some players' heads split open, and fans killed themselves by jumping from the upper deck. The Buddha said, these players and fans were not yet ready to hear the ultimate truth, but fear not, they will be, re be reborn immediately in the pure land of Fenway Park. That's both the Buddha. Thank you, Don. That is, I just have to tell our listeners, it's a, it's a pleasurable, very fun and informative read. But I have to warn you, Don, already I'm seeing in the chat field, uh, people feel that this is Yankee-centric and someone wrote, go Cubs and Red Sox are fullness. So we'll get to all that. So I'm going to ask a few questions and to remind our listeners, you can ask questions in the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. Um, but first, I'd just like to ask, and by the way, in case you think it's Yankee-centric, I'm a Dodgers fan, so hopefully that balances things out a bit. Um, but how did you get the idea for a book, for the book, and uh, what was the writing process like? Uh, well, uh, you know, I've been, a, as I say, I've been a Yankees fan uh, my whole life. Uh, my first memory is of the 1960 World Series uh, when the Yankees lost to the Pirates. And so I've sort of had these two parts of my brain, the Buddhism part and the baseball part uh, for many, many years. Uh, in the summertime, uh, I would, uh, for a while, I would watch every game. Um, 
but I found it to be, frankly, quite boring and, and a waste of time to sit through uh, every game all season long, I have to confess. So my summer uh, uh, sort of schedule is basically to write during the day and to translate at night. So what I would do would do, have to do my translations and my study, but have the game on uh, in the next room, uh, but just turned up loud enough so I could hear any cheers. So if there was a cheer, I could go next door, watch the replays, watch an inning if it was uh, interesting, go back to work. Uh, and so somehow during that process, these two parts of my brain came in contact, the baseball part and the, uh, the Buddhism part. So uh, writing about, of course, my own sort of life as a fan was easy enough to do, but then writing the actual book I found to be a challenge because I, um, frankly, I found it hard to write, it, write in a didactic voice, uh, to, to write a, a kind of a Dharma book. Uh, and it occurred to me then that uh, I thought about this, uh, as you know, in Tibetan Buddhism, we have this idea of the, the Dharma, the, the treasure text. These texts that are buried by Padmasambhava and discovered uh, years later, centuries later. Sometimes they're discovered from being dug up from the ground or in a lake. But there's also the, the gonder, the, the, uh, the, the mind treasure, uh, the, the, the text that's found within the heart of the disciple. And strangely, it was almost as if this baseball sutra was a, was a gonder to me. It sort of appeared uh, in my mind. And, uh, and it, was, it was almost a process of like automatic writing. It just kind of came out. So it became a sutra, the sutra was there. Once there's a sutra, I can write a commentary. So that was easy. So it was really the sutra form that was uh, this kind of strange blessing that came to me that provided the root text and the commentary was easy to do because that, that's my job. Uh, so that was, that was the process. Well, speaking of sutras, there are plenty of allusions to sutras uh, throughout the book. For instance, the first reading that you did, do you want to talk about that a bit? Yeah, so there are a lot of, uh, you know, I wrote the book in such a way that people who knew nothing about Buddhism could learn something, and, uh, but people who didn't know would sort of pick up uh, these various illusions. Uh, so as you remember from our podcast last summer, Jackie Stone and I did, did a book together on Lotus Sutra. So I was really writing the, this uh, Buddha Takes the Mound while I was working with Jackie on the Lotus Sutra book. So the Lotus Sutra was very much on my brain. Uh, and so, uh, so you see at the beginning then, uh, we have uh, the Buddha um, shoots out a ray of light from between his eyes, as happens uh, in the Lotus Sutra. And then uh, Manjushri uh, is, is asked by Maitreya, what was that? I, I've never seen that before. Uh, and, and Manjushri says, oh, I remember long ago uh, that the Buddha did that and then caught the Lotus Sutra. So here I had uh, Babe Ruth play the Maitreya part and uh, Lou Gehrig played the Mandushu part and have Babe Ruth ask what was that? And so he, he then tells him what that was. Uh, so that's, that's one Lotus Sutra illusion. One which I didn't read is uh, right before the Buddha is about to teach the Lotus, uh, one of the strangest moments in Buddhist literature is that 5,000 monks and nuns just get up and walk out. And, and, and the Buddha says, let them go. So before the Buddha teaches the, uh, the baseball sutra, 500 players uh, get up and leave. And I give their names, and of course, these are the people who use their performance enhancing drugs. And the Buddha says, let, let them go. It will be long before they enter, enter the pure land. So uh, that was the Lotus Sutra. Then, uh, you know, in Vimalakirti, uh, the, the Vimalakirti is about to invite all of these bodhisattvas into his house, and, and Shariputra says, there's no chairs in here. They, they, they can't fit. And Bhamalakirti says, did you come for the Dharma or did you come for the chairs? So here I have Babe Ruth say, did you come, the Buddha say to Babe Ruth, did you come for the Dharma, did you come for the dugout? Uh, and then there's, uh, of course, the, I had a couple heart sutra things as I just read. And so that's there, Diamond Sutra is there, and I'll go through a passage that's uh, reminiscent of the uh, Pure Land Sutra that I'll read at the end. Well, we do have a lot of Red Sox fans, it seems. Um, and just to show that you're not entirely biased, you consider Ted Williams, the he was the incarnation of Vajrapani. So perhaps you can tell us who Vajrapani is and why Ted Williams uh, is his uh, incarnation. It's a wonderful chapter. Yeah, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, we have the famous Bodhisattva power of Vajrapani in, in the Mahayana. But when you go back and look at the earliest Buddhist uh, sculpture from Gandhara, there's often a, a bearded figure or kind of this bulky guy next to the Buddha with a big club over his shoulder. 
And uh, this is the original Bhadrapani. He's like the Buddha's uh, protector. And there are a number of places in which he's there to sort of uh, be there uh, to, to guard the Buddha. So when you look at this, we never don't really know what Bhadra means in Sanskrit. We know what it looks like that from the you know, from tantric practice. But uh, when you see it in the earliest representations in Buddhist art, it's just a big club. So Vajra means club and Pani means hand. And so it really just means batter. Uh, and so it occurred to me that there have been uh, these wrathful figures who have appeared in the course of baseball history, uh, who appear as Vajra Pani in age after age to teach about uh, the science of hitting. And of course, there's someone greater than that than Ted Williams. So I devote an entire uh, chapter to him. And then the Buddha gives a secret teaching, uh, which is that comes uh, from, from Vajra Pani. And, uh, and then other players, Jackie Robinson and others have also been Buddha Pond in the past. I thought that was particularly clever. And I love the, you know, an example of like what I learned reading it is just, for instance, the etymology of the word Vajra or what it could mean and what it has meant. It's meant many different things because I always thought of Vajra as simply the Vajra that I see typically held. Right. Yeah. Okay. So that brings me to my last question. The book also is very serious in a way. It has a lot of serious um, material in there. Um, do you want to talk about that? Uh, it's a lot of fun to read, but there's also a serious uh, thread going through it too. Well, um, I really, the idea of the book was to talk about suffering. Um, the original title was uh, the Baseball Sutra, a meditation on suffering, but uh, that was something that we ended up changing uh, during the course of our conversations. It was St. Martin Press. Uh, and frankly, uh, it's been, of course, this was written uh, long before uh, the virus, but of course, I think we've all been thinking a lot about suffering uh, over the past few months and how the suffering of pain and suffering of change, suffering of conditioning really are true. Uh, there is a profundity there, uh, which the Buddha talks about in the Baseball Sutra and of course, many places else as, as well. Uh, but I wanted to really uh, use the book uh, as a way to uh, also bring out sort of the, the power of Buddhist Tantra. Um, when we talk about Buddhist Tantra, we have this famous phrase, uh, bringing desire into the path. Uh, that is, we take these things which are the afflictions, desire, hatred, and ignorance, desire and hatred and particular desire, and we, we use those, those things that we're trying to destroy, we use those uh, to achieve enlightenment. And so I wanted to sort of, uh, again, talk about the baseball diamond as a mandala, where this tantric practice can take place. And at the end of the book, as you know, I provide a kind of a, where the Buddha provides a kind of a dumo practice, a fairly profound uh, visualization practice. Uh, but the larger message is really that uh, the, the, as players and fans, uh, we can go to the, the park, we can watch the game, we can listen to it and let all these emotions, the desire, keep it run wild. We can love our team, we can hate the umpire, we can uh, live and die with every pitch. Uh, these emotions are, can, can sort of, we can indulge those in a situation where they don't mean anything. That is in, in a setting in which it's really okay if the team loses, because as we know, in baseball, if you win six out of 10 games, if you lose 40% of your games, you go to the playoffs every year. If you get a hit 30% of the time, you go to the Hall of Fame. It's a game about loss, it's a game about suffering. And so we can learn a lot about suffering, indulge these emotions uh, as fans, and then when, when we leave the ballpark, we have a way of dealing with those emotions in ways that can be a, in some way a benefit to ourselves and others. Okay, so we're gonna go to the questions our listeners are asking, um, but first I'll begin with um, what our host, Danya, in the office calls some funny comments. Just so you hear what the response has been so far, uh, Don, from Alan Malthus. Also, emptiness is very appropriate for this point in the season. This is from Jim Blackwood. No self-respecting Buddha would be a Yankees fan. I won't say about that. Uh, from Gompo Jack, uh, no one's pitching because there ain't no batters. And reborn as Fenway sounds like hell to a Yankees fan. So we can go on to the questions now. I just thought those comments were rather funny. So Louise asks, I'm a Red Sox fan. Do you agree that the auspicious, historical, and greatly esteemed feat of a four-game ALCS and a four-game 
World Series in 2004 has earned them many years of good karma? Uh, so I was um, in Italy uh, when during those, actually, uh, as, as you know, the Yankees were up uh, three games to none. Uh, and uh, I was in Italy just waiting to read in the USA Today that they'd won, and I, and I saw that they had actually lost to the Red Sox. So I've never watched those games. Um, I, there's an ESPN uh, sort of uh, documentary about them, which I've never watched. And I do say in the book, uh, if you wanted to torture me, you could uh, put me in one of those chairs like in Clockwork Orange, but they hold, hold your eyes open and make me watch uh, that particular documentary about the Red Sox. So. Uh, of course, anyway, the whole Yankees Red Sox uh, thing is another place where you can indulge all of your hatred and all of your love in ways that I think uh, can be an actually uh, fortuitous and beneficial uh, on the field and, and in the stadium. Okay, I just want to tell everyone very soon, if not already, a link to the book will be put in the chat field, and I'll remind you that of you of that. I'll remind you of that again at the end of this uh, discussion. Uh, but if you want to get the book, we're going to post the link. So another question. This book is currently ranked number six in the Amazon list for baseball coaching. Was this the intent of the book, an introduction to Buddhism for those who play or coach baseball? You know, I, I happened to check Amazon over the weekend. And for whatever reason, I think probably because Tricycle uh, it was promoting this event, it was uh, number one in baseball coaching in Amazon. Wow. Uh, I have to say, I didn't, I wasn't aware that Amazon had a category called baseball coaching. Uh, and so that was, uh, you know, very rewarding to think that someone might buy this book and think about uh, using it as a way to become a better player and, of course, a better fan, which is, was the intention. But uh, baseball coaching was not a category I, I recognized from uh, the, uh, the Amazon list. Uh, of course, all my books are all in various Buddhism lists. I never looked at the baseball list on Amazon until this book came out. So that's been a bit of a revelation for me. Yeah, it's a revelation to me too. I didn't know about that category even existed. So Victoria asks, what about the emptiness of empty stadiums? Of a runner starting on second base in the 10th inning, unearned. What? I'm a Dodger fan too. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, these, these changes, I think, are, are very disconcerting to all of us uh, because uh, we, the, the game is a game of tradition, a game of memory to do these things uh, which have not been done before, especially the runner on second base in the winning game, I think, is very disconcerting. And a lot of the re re relief pitchers, as you know, are complaining about that. Mm -hmm. yeah, the stadium uh, was done once before, as you remember, during some riots in Baltimore. And this is just going to be so strange to, to try to think of it. And they're going to pipe in cheers and all these sorts of things. So we have a whole new set of memories that we'll be creating this, this summer, uh, clearly, with this kind of season. Okay. Mark asks, <clears throat> excuse me, talk about the 108 stitches in a baseball and the 108 beads in the Buddhist mala. Coincidence? Go Red Sox. I think we're getting a lot of Red Sox fans here. Yeah. I, I would just say uh, to the Red Sox fans um, that... Um, as a Yankees fan, one of the things uh, I wanted to do was to write a book to, that would actually indicate that Yankees fans also suffer. Uh, <laughs> you know, that we don't get a lot of sympathy, but uh, as I say in the book, um, my two most bitter memories as a fan is as an eight-year-old uh, kid when Bill Mazeroski hit the game, home run in game seven and beat the Yankees uh, uh, in Pittsburgh. And then in 2001, uh, when the, in game seven, when the Yankees were destined to win for so many reasons. Uh, and uh, Mo uh, you know, threw into center field and, uh, and then the, the Diamondbacks ended up scoring. Uh, it was that little uh, bloop hit. Uh, Jeter had been pulled in, they'd pulled in the infield and so the bloop sort of fell where Jeter would have been standing if he'd been in normal position. I actually turned off the, the, the game, the, the set before the ball hit the ground so I never saw that hit. But those, those two losses continue to haunt me uh, despite the fact that the Yankees have won so many other times. And so the, the point is that even Yankee fans uh, can suffer because baseball is about suffering. Uh, 108 stitches. Uh, quite right. It's no coincidence. Uh, and uh, the, the greater coincidence is that in, in uh, tantric meditation, we uh, often visualize in the center of our chest something called the indestructible drop, uh, which is uh, white on the top and red on the bottom. 
in the baseball sutra, uh, this indestructible drop actually falls down the central channel, uh, red and white, uh, just like in our tantric texts, and then vis visualizing ourselves as a batter uh, down at the, at the chakra of the, below the navel. We strike the ball and it goes up uh, in, into the stands. And so, uh, quite quite right. 108 stitches on the ball. 108 uh, beads on our on our on our rosaries. Hey, that's a great answer. So Jim asks, baseball is a game with no plot. Did you consider this when writing the book? Definitely, it has no plot. It has no clock. <coughs> right. It has no Absolutely. ending. It can go on forever. Uh, I talk about the fact that uh, you know a, a batter can can foul off an infinite number of balls. Uh, a game can go for an infinite number of uh, uh, of innings. A pitcher can have an infinite number of strikeouts if there's a pass ball because the batter can run to first. And so, baseball is a, it's not about time. Uh, it has no clock. It's about infinity. And so, I think that's yet another reason why it's so uh, why the Buddha invented it. Okay, next question. What would the Buddha say about the extensive use of sabermetrics? Defensive shifting? That's true. I mean, that's, uh, you know, the game, we want the game to always stay the same. Uh, there are still people who object to the fact that there's a DH. As, of course, you know, this season, there would be DHs in, in both leagues. And so these changes occur, uh, but of course, in Buddhism, we have to learn to deal with change, right? The, the second of the, three, of the three types of, of suffering is the suffering of change, and that's when something happens that we, that, that we don't want to have happen. It's unexpected. And so all of these changes that we see to the game are yet another lesson in impermanence. Uh, so again, another Buddhist truth uh, finds its way even to the end of the rule book. Okay, Tim asks, does Professor Lopez have any comment on Harvey Dorfman's teaching in the mental game of baseball that there is only one thing that matters, the next pitch? So, you know, I think there is this kind of baseball mindfulness that, that happens there. Um, I do talk about the fact that, uh, again, around the idea of suffering, uh, typically, you know, between the two teams and all the pitchers, there are about 300 pitches uh, in, in, a, in a game. You think about it, every single pitch is a cause of suffering for someone, uh, for the pitcher, for the batter, uh, for the fans of one team or another, from the players on either side. Uh, so the pitch becomes the absolute center of all focus, of all, of all attention, of all mindfulness. Uh, if you're not mindful, you, you don't become a, a great hitter. Uh, Ted Williams wrote this whole book on the science of hitting, uh, which, which talks a lot about the concentration that's necessary. So yeah, definitely uh, it's pitch by pitch. Every pitch then sets off its whole drama. Every pitch is, is another lifetime in a sense. Okay, Peter asks, how do you feel about the designated hitter in the American League and then in the National League? Well, I'm, I've always been an American League fan, uh, and so the, the DH is something that I'm very used to. Uh, however, I think that a baseball purist would really want uh, pitchers to hit. There's so much more strategy that comes into the game uh, once you have uh, pitchers who can be lifted for pinch hitters and so forth. Uh, I'm quite used to it now. I like it. I, I do think that the two leagues uh, should have the same rule. Uh, and I don't think they're going to go back to uh, – pitching in the American League. So I think probably the DH is going to be the future for both leagues. And again, we think of uh, pitchers who've been injured running the bases or, you know, just uh, having a, a, an awkward swing. And those, those injuries to pitchers are very costly to a team. And so that's another reason for the DH in both leagues. Well, Brian follows up with, would the Buddha be in favor of, of, it, of the universal DH? And is that a duality we want to lose? <sighs> both. Yeah, I think you could argue it either way. It depends on who your favorite team is. Uh, and of course, the Buddha has his own sort of uh, special, uh, his upaya, right? Uh, his techniques for leading us along the path. And maybe the DH is one, one of those for, for American League fans. Okay, so James asks, not me, but another James out there asks, Roger Maris was a hero of mine, and yet he was resented for breaking Babe Ruth's record. <laughs> 
his record, his record demeaned with an asterisk. Is there a Buddhist lesson about suffering in there? Uh, definitely. I mean, of course, you noted that when, when I uh, sort of placed the immortals uh, in their positions at Yankee Stadium, I was very, made sure to put Roger Maris there in the upfield. I saw him play many times. Uh, I was also a great fan of his. Uh, I thought what happened to him during that year in 61 was terrible. Uh, and it really is, you probably also saw uh, this recent documentary about uh, Sammy Sosa and Martin McGuire and all of the things that they had to go through during that year. You, you um, read interviews with George Brett the year that he was, uh, uh, he was, he was hitting 400 for most of the season, how he had to deal with, with questions every single day. So there is this kind of celebrity around records, especially today, which I think is a particular form of suffering for fans, definitely. And Maris, going way back to 61, I think is the prime example of that. Okay, so back to the 108 stitches. Rick asks, do you know why there are 108 stitches? Why this number? I, I do not know. It's just, it's, uh, I, it seems like a coincidence, but I think we just have to think that, that the Buddha designed it that way. Okay, these questions are starting to get personal. Christy asks, isn't saying the book is Yankee Center just an example of attachment? I am definitely attached to Yankees. There's no question about that. Uh, I love the Yankees. I hate the Red Sox. Uh, that's the love and hate that I bring to, the, to my fandom. Uh, but it's a love and hate that I can exercise within this world of baseball. Uh, and it allows me to see how love and hate work. And so in more consequential moments, I can deal with those emotions, uh, I think somewhat more wisely, at least that's my hope. So looking at these brings a lot of insight then. It's an opportunity to, to observe. Definitely. Right. Okay. Paul asks, one of the joys of baseball is the pace and the periods of quiet. Please comment on the relationship with meditation. Good question. So uh, one of the other, I, the, the Buddha teaches the two forms of meditation in the Baseball Sutra. The, the, I, I've already mentioned the tantric one, but the other one is just, uh, is what we might call baseball mindfulness. And what you do is you sit in a meditative posture. Uh, you put your hands in your lap as you typically do, but instead of having an empty space there, you're holding a ball. Uh, you turn on the game, or you're, if you're at home, you turn off the sound, and you just watch the ball uh, from pitcher to catcher uh, as it's hit, as it's foul. Your, your, your mindfulness is placed entirely on the ball. And that silence then I think is, as you say, quite conducive to meditative serenity as long as you're not listening to the, the announcers, listening to all the chatter around the game. There's a, a beauty about the game and silence uh, that, that I think is quite, uh, as you say, I think it's quite similar to meditation in some contexts, yeah. Now the next question reminds me of a part in your book where <clears throat> the player is tossed from league to league, up and down, minors, majors, and so forth. He's sort of caught in the round of samsara, which I really, really had a lot of fun reading. So somebody asks, there are thousands of players who toil in the minor leagues and never make it to the show. What Buddhist lessons there? So, um, the, uh, the chapter uh, called Impermanence, uh, which is in the current issue of Tricycle, is all about that. Uh, I have a player uh, rise, uh, come out of the dugout. He's a, a person who's been in the minor leagues uh, his entire career. He talks, he lists all the teams that he has played for. And the one time that he, got, he made it to the major leagues, he was called up to the Dodgers. And in the third or fourth game that he played in, he got hit on the hand uh, and broke his hand and was injured and never played again. And so the other parallel, another parallel between uh, the Buddhist cosmos and baseball are the major leagues and minor leagues. Uh, we have these, these layers of minor leagues, uh, the lowest are called low A, in which you carry your own bags and you sleep in, you know, bad motels with no air conditioning, you ride on buses. So I talk a lot about that and how players actually wander between worlds just as in, in the realm of samsara, uh, going up and down, up and down. Uh, and with, as you say, so many players never, never ascending uh, to the God realm of the major leagues. Just as we say in Buddhism, right, the vast majority of sentient beings are in as a, they're animals or they're ghosts or they're in hell and human rebirth is very rare so rare also is, is, is a major league uh, contract. 
Okay, uh, a lot of questions here. Major League Baseball is supporting the BLM movement and some players are kneeling in solidarity. You consider this action a Buddhist act or expression, an effort to minimize suffering in others? I think it's a bodhisattva deed, yeah, to kneel, uh, to e express one's uh, solidarity with and awareness uh, of the suffering of others. Uh, and so uh, I think the Buddha would definitely approve of players kneeling there during the national anthem. Uh, and I think we're gonna see that a lot this season. Okay, so Clark asks, what are the ethical teachings of the Baseball Sutra? Does stealing, si does stealing uh, signs violate the precept of refraining from taking what is not freely given? So uh, again, if we're going to think about um, Contra, right? So in, in baseball, uh, if you are, if your team uh, is, is playing defense, you long for the twin killing, right? For the double play. Uh, stein, signs are stolen all the time. That's a part of the game. Uh, we, of course, we saw what happened uh, with the Astros, but they were doing something that had not, that had not been done before. So the ordinary stealing of, of a runner on second, looking in, figuring out what that is, trying to convey that with some sort of a gesture to the batter, all that's part of the game. Uh, but I think what the Astros did was something that was, was unethical. And uh, one of my friends uh, commented that uh, the Astros are gonna be reborn uh, as giant uh, garbage cans that are, that are struck with baseball bats. And that, that happens that for many lifetimes. So that's a very, that's what like the Buddhists have these trifling hells. That would be a trifling hell for the Astros. Yeah. Okay, Kendall asks, are there any major league baseball players who are practicing Buddhists? Uh, I don't know that now. Uh, I, there were certainly a number of players as, as I was growing up uh, who were Buddhists. Uh, primarily they were uh, uh, Nichiren Buddhists, the followers of the Lotus Sutra. Uh, as I said uh, in the introduction of the book, I think there's a whole book to be written about the players who, who were or are Buddhist, uh, but uh, I was trying to write a different book that was really about how uh, all of baseball is Buddhist and just didn't know it. Okay. Barry asks, please talk about the karma of the 2001 series, Rosius et al. Uh, well, there's a whole chapter about that. Uh, and because, again, um, as you know, if you're a Yankees fan, uh, that uh, there was a bunt uh, to Warren Rivera. He fielded the ball beautifully and actually was able to cut down the runner at third. Uh, the batter was a slow runner and the replay showed that uh, Rocha's had the ball when the runner was about halfway to first. And so he could have thrown to first base uh, for the double play, which would have changed the outcome of the game. So uh, one of the great mysteries for Yankees fans, especially around that uh, so painful 2001 World Series is why did Scott Brocious, a beloved player, hold the ball at third? Uh, and the Buddha uh, basically uh, recounts a Jataka tale, uh, which explains why that happened. And so uh, it, we finally learn the answer uh, in, in that chapter. It's called a chapter called Karma. Okay, Grace asks, when considering the 12 links of the pennant origination, which came first, the ball or the bat? I guess they co-arise, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, the, when we look at the pennant origination from the point of view of, of, of Nagarjuna, uh, and uh, basically the, the bat and the ball really cannot exist without, without the other. Uh, they are completely, they are interdependent in that sense. So uh, from the Madhyamak point of view, uh, they have to be there together in order to, to, to mean anything. It's a function. In themselves, they're nothing. Uh, they're, I, I talked briefly about the bases. You can just take a base, and depending on how a player is standing on it, uh, you know exactly which base it is. We have phrases for each of the bases. If you say, "Never make the first, uh, never make the uh, the first or third out," uh, maybe, never make. What do they say about the third? I'm forgetting now. Uh, never make the first out of the inning at third base. Um, uh, second base is, of course, the place uh, where, where, you, where you steal signs. First is where you're typically looking to steal. So this, the, the base is exactly the same thing. 
It's simply the square, which used to be just a, a bag of sawdust. And yet we impute, we project meaning onto these three identical squares of, of cloth and they, they take on great meaning. So that the bat and the ball also then uh, fall into that category. I have to say, it popped up on my screen. Somebody said, this guy has an answer for everything. And it's like one of the impressive things about you, Don. <laughs> There's no question you can't answer. Um, let me see here. Um, Rick Peterson writes, I'm a practicing Buddhist. Uh, this is Rick Peterson, former pitching coach of, coach of New York Mets, Oakland A's, Moneyball, and Brewers. Now that I'm retired from baseball, I'm relieved of the suffering of the daily losses. That was a comment he made. Do you want to say yeah. anything about that? Absolutely. The losses are so hard, right? And they go on forever, and they're, and they're losing streaks. Uh, they're slumps. You know, they're pitchers who can't find the strike zone. There's so many forms of suffering in baseball. And players really, it's a hard game, right? As they say, the dog days of August are coming. Of course, they're not going to be dog days this season because the season's just starting, but the long season with, you know, from pitchers and catchers reporting to spring training to the season to the playoffs, it's a long season. It's a tough season. We also found the answer to the other question. We do have a practicing Buddhist here uh, who's in baseball. So, great. Um, Jeff asks, uh, please explain the scout's phrase inner clock in describing the rhythm of the game. So, you know, we think about, it's often said that hitting a baseball is the most difficult action in all of sport. And it's only become more difficult as fastballs have become faster. And so we think about the, the eyesight, the rhythm of a player, of a batter beginning his swing when the ball is just inches out of the pitcher's hand and what an amazing feat that is. Uh, the rhythm of the game is perfect. Uh, one thing, when we think about the omniscience of the Buddha, how could someone have invented a game in which First base is 90 feet away from home. And that no matter how fast you are, whether you were playing in the 1880s or the 1980s or in 2020, a normally hit rounder to an infielder will always be an out. That is a sign of omniscience that a game could be invented that spaced the field in such a way that this would always be true, that has not changed. And so again, uh, I'm utterly convinced that uh, the Buddha in any baseball. Yeah. Well, with that, we'll ask you to read from, I believe the Vajrapani chapter, is that? What uh, no, I'm gonna read from, uh, from the very last chapter. Okay. So this is, um, this is a serious passage, uh, and I've chosen it uh, in part because of all of the people that we've lost over the past few months. The Buddha's final statement in the sutra is considered particularly important, and so we should repeat his final statement in the baseball sutra. He says, wherever a father or mother plays catch with a son of good lineage or a daughter of good lineage, that place becomes a pure land. And if at the time of their death, that son of good lineage or daughter of good lineage thinks of the mountain and the diamond, I will appear at your deathbed and deliver them to the diamond that is eternal, surviving the destruction that comes at the end of this degenerate age. That's the passage. Here's my commentary. In Buddhism, son of good lineage and daughter of good lineage do not mean someone from an aristocratic background or a wealthy family. They mean someone who has compassion for others. The Buddha says that we do not need to go to the trouble of buying an expensive ticket, fighting traffic, paying for parking, walking to the gates, and going through security in order for the benefits of baseball to be bestowed upon us. We simply need to play catch. All that is needed is two gloves, one ball, a setting sun, and some open space, 
away from windows. All the truths of baseball can be found in this most precious of childhood pastimes, where the lessons of the game are passed down from parent to child. How to get down for a grounder, how to get under a fly, how to catch the ball with two hands, how to watch the ball into the mitt, where the child can dispel their inevitable frustrations toward the parent by throwing a ball at the parent's head as hard as they can without fear of punishment, and with the parent offering instruction in how to throw it harder and more accurately toward the cranial target. So much of the complicated relationship of parent and child is played out by playing catch. And we must recall that in Buddhism, because of the endless cycle of rebirth, each being has been our parent in the past life. And so that whenever we play catch with anyone, we're playing catch with our parent. The Buddha said that, when, that wherever we play this most perfect game, that place will be transformed into a pure land, a place of peace and happiness, protected from the three types of suffering. And he said that when our parents are gone and we lie on our deathbed, the Buddha created this game of baseball for us will appear at our bedside in the guise of the third base coach of our favorite team, his right arm twirling, waving us home. Thank you, Don. I just have to say that it's a great book and we are putting the link in the chat field uh, if you'd like uh, to get it. I think we have time for a few more questions. Um, Allison asks, what does the Buddha hope for during the seventh inning stretch? Um, <clears throat> again, you know, the, the seventh inning stretch has become such a different thing than it used to be. When I used to go to games as a kid, uh, it really was just a stretch. You just stood up and talked to the people next to you and talked about the game. Uh, now there's all these sort of strange dances on the Jumbotron and people dressed up as cartoon characters running around the field. Uh, so it's not what it used to be. And I, I frankly think the Buddha would not approve of the current version of setting seventh inning stretch. I think he would see it as a, as a nice little time for a meditation break. <laughs> so you don't want to waste that seventh inning stretch then. Okay, so Jim asks, Unlike other sports, baseball players and teams are tested over impossibly long seasons. Rarely does one, rarely does one game, one at bat, have the meaning except in, aggregation of, except in the aggregation of actions. Is this part of the meditative nature of the game? Nice question. You know, I think it's really more of the samsaric nature of the game, uh, but the amount of failure that happens in the game, even for the best players, and um, the player has to endure that failure game after game, inning after inning, for month after month. I mean, I think it really baseball is, is teaching us about how to deal with and understand suffering uh, more than anything else. Uh, and it's, it's again, I, I hesitate to see that as a Yankees fan, but when you think about the game and the slumps and the injuries and the DL, all the things that players go through and they, and they suffer, uh, you know, Players, of course, in the big league, get paid very well for that suffering. But as someone already noted, the vast majority of players uh, don't get those salaries. They're doing that in the minor leagues. And the game then teaches us so much about these basic Buddhist truths without us even really knowing it. So. OK, Tim asks, has Professor Lopez read A Zen Way of Baseball by Sanahar O and David Faulkner? It's a great book, he says. I have not read it, but thank you for the recommendation. I, I certainly will. Okay, so I, I'm wondering uh, myself if this was just a welcome break from your, well, I wouldn't say more serious books because it's also a serious book, but your more scholarly work. Because I, I really enjoyed it because it's so full of humor at the same time as you read just a moment ago, it's very grounding and sober. And it really is also about suffering. I, I'm just wondering if it was just a nice thing to be doing so different from, say, the Lotus Sutra book, which is wonderful, but so academically rigorous. Well, you know, it's I've done a lot of books, and uh, they're all scholarly. Uh, I care a lot about writing and, uh, and trying to write well, trying to be able to bring Buddhism to a larger audience than just uh, my fellow Buddhologists. Uh, 
although I'm also reaching, trying to reach them, of course. And so this was an attempt to, again, as I said, to, to find a slightly different voice. Uh, but, uh, but as I also noted, uh, it was very difficult for me to make that voice my own. And so I had to really ventriloquize, ventriloquize the Buddha. Mm -hmm. uh, I had to, uh, I know what a sutra sounds like so I could write a sutra and because that sutra appeared in my mind, it was easy to take dictation. So that was, that was as a writing experience, it was something uh, very interesting to watch and in some, in some moments quite moving because I didn't feel like it was really me writing. Uh, so it was, it was certainly a different uh, experience for me. Uh, it was enjoyable because I love baseball, uh, but I also uh, saw it as an opportunity to try to bring uh, some of the, what I find the most profound, profound teachings of Buddhism to a different audience. Right, you write both scholarly books, but books that are also quite accessible. You sort of uh, uh, cross, uh, cross over often, your books are. Um, uh, actually, they're very enjoyable. But I was even surprised when I got this one. Were your colleagues surprised? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure. You know, I'm not sure many of my colleagues have actually read it. You know, there's a kind of a strange uh, taboo uh, among academics to reveal your your sports fandom. Uh, and so, having written the book, uh, a number of uh, of my fellow Buddhologists have uh, confessed to me that they are huge baseball fans, but they've never told anyone. <laughs> and so they, they're happy that I've sort of announced this, and they, they felt that they had someone they could talk to about these things. Uh, so I, I haven't really gotten that much response. Uh, the book just came out, so I haven't heard from uh, too many people in my field, except those who are very serious fans, and uh, because they probably want to keep their anonymity, I won't mention their names. Okay. But they're people that you, that you know. It's okay. Okay, it's kind of like uh, a professor of religions talking about their own religious practice. It's just not done. Yeah, yeah right, yeah. So I want to ask you about that. But, but I think we're out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank our listeners and thank you, Don, and everyone joining us this evening. I'd like uh, to read Buddha Takes, uh, if you'd like to read Buddha Takes the Mound or order it for a friend this baseball season, remember tomorrow's opening day. The link to purchase it can be found in the Zoom chat on the event page at priceful.org slash events, where you can also view our upcoming events schedule. A recording of tonight's session will also be posted there shortly. To make a donation to support these free offerings, you can go to priceful.org slash donate. Again, uh, a link to the book is in the chat field. We'll be leaving shortly. But I just wanted to say thank you, Don. It was a real pleasure as always. Uh, we haven't done this since we did the podcast on the Lotus Sutra, which people can also listen to at our podcast at tricycle.org. Um, so thank you, Don. It's, it's great to talk to you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, James. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. And watch baseball tomorrow. <laughs>